because man's task is to make the earth after the model of heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Man's project is to heavenize the earth. Man is made to transform the world from glory to glory, to take hold of it and break it down and remake it after the image of heaven. Welcome back to the Reformed Reset, part of Take Hold Studios. My name is Grant, and the weaker vessel, my wife Erica, is not with me because I have the privilege of doing another interview. And this time, I am honored to have on the show pastor and author Rich Lusk. Rich, thanks to you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Grant. Awesome. Guys, if you would, please, right now, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get notified. And if you're in podcast world, please subscribe to the show and leave a review. Whether you hate us or love us, we'd love to hear from you. And down in the description below is going to be a ton of links to our website, our merch store, our Patreon, if you want to financially support us and be a part of our monthly Q&A episode, as well as links to... Uh, Rich's books and website and resources and stuff. I'm going to have all of that down in the description. So I'm, I'm sure after this conversation, you guys will want to go read more. I'm, I'm hoping at least. I'm hoping at least this conversation causes that uh, in the listeners. So, um, so that'll all be down there below. Some of it, you got to pay for it. Some of it's free. Um, we'll talk about that as we, as we uh, carry on the conversation as well. So um, I think... Yeah, that's it for admin stuff. I want to really get into this conversation. It should be rich, pun intended. Um, <laughs> First time uh, I've ever heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, all right. So, uh, Rich, if you would, please, uh, I, I hope the listeners do know who you are and the work that you've done. I have uh, a few of your books here in, in, in the flesh that I will display here in a minute. But if you would, please introduce yourself to the listeners. Yeah, I am Rich Lusk. I am the pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church right outside of Birmingham, Alabama. We are a CREC congregation. Uh, I'm married to Jenny, and we've got four kids, and uh, two are getting married this summer, and uh, got two that are in college or or will be uh, by the time fall rolls around. So uh, I guess you could say things are pretty busy in the Lusk household. Uh, but uh, I've been involved in some kind of pastoral ministry since uh, 1995, uh, which is the same year I got married. And I uh, grew up in a Christian home, very thankful for faithful Christian parents, uh, moved around quite a bit growing up, got exposure to a lot of different uh, churches and traditions. And uh, finally, in my college years, really settled into the Reformed faith and uh, did not uh, have a um, call to the pastorate. Uh, that was, I would say, really clear right off the bat. Uh, but just through a number of circumstances, God made that very clear to me uh, over time. And uh, so I'd actually been a pre-med student. By the time I graduated college, I actually, instead of going off to med school, I went to work for a church and I just have never looked back. So uh, very grateful for God's grace to me in so many ways. Very grateful uh, for the church. And really my goal, and I, I got involved in this uh, discussion about baptism. Well, I don't even know that there was a discussion um, going on <laughs> about baptismal efficacy, to be honest, not much of one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I started writing on these issues about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. And, uh, and, and that was after just doing a lot of study. And one of the things that drove me to do my study is that when I really got into the Reformed faith, uh, I just thought, you know, I've been reading all these books about Martin Luther and John Calvin, people that are held up as heroes. I want to go read them in for myself. Uh, for myself. And, and when I did, uh, it's really interesting. When I was reading through Calvin's Institutes, which I, I, you know, if you are a reader, you like to read theology books. Oh, yeah. uh, a lot of people, I, I think, don't pick up the Institutes because it's, you know, it's a large book. It's usually sold in two volumes. It's, you know, it's 1,500 pages. But uh, I would just say it's really worth reading. Calvin has got a very warm and doxological way of, of writing theology. It's not going to read like a systematic theology textbook for the most part. Occasionally it will, but not for the most part. But when I got to book four, and th- this was really a turning point for me, and this is you know, sometime like in the, in the mid-90s when I was reading this, 
uh, when I got to book four of the institutes, uh, Calvin was, book four is about the church. And I have gotten to where I don't want to know so much if you are a five-point Calvinist. I think that's a great question to ask. But a question I want to know is, are you a four-book Calvinist? What do you do with book four of the Institutes? This is where Calvin deals with ecclesiology, and that flows out into his view of, 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 of civil society, of, uh, of, of culture as a whole. But it's largely about the church. And when I got to the section on the sacraments, I realized he was saying things that sounded very different than what I was reading from his modern um, interpreters or those who claim to be in the Calvinist tradition, who claim to be speaking for Calvin and, and the Calvinist tradition, uh, what Calvin was saying about baptism sounded very different. And that really intrigued me. I had not heard Reformed theologians or pastors talk the way Calvin was talking about baptism and, and, and really not the Lord's Supper either, although that was, that was um, maybe on occasion I did, but it was, um, it was really baptism, the, the difference there that was so striking between this modern uh, reformed rhetoric about baptism and Calvin's rhetoric about baptism. And so that sent me down this journey of studying both biblical theology and historical theology. And I've been interested in investigating this question on both of those tracks uh, ever since. The, the, the biblical theology track, what does the Bible actually say? Who's right about this? What's the best way to uh, articulate our baptismal theology and to put it into practice? And also the, the historical track. What, what has the church historically said about this? What have our greatest theologians said about this? What has Calvin and what has the Reformed tradition said about this? And so uh, that's really where my interest came from. Of course, having children uh, also was, was a big catalyst for this. Uh, just recognizing, uh, you know, having our, ch our children baptized as infants, which I was not. I, I was baptized in the Baptist, you know, I walked the aisle and was baptized right. uh, in a Baptist church at, at eight years old. Uh, obviously, come to a different understanding later on. But uh, having my children baptized and then wanting to be able to uh, explain to them in, in, par in parenting and being a father, seeking to, to raise godly offspring, uh, wanting to be able to articulate to them what their baptism means and understanding how the fact that they are baptized changes the way that I should raise them. It, it changes the way that I act as a father, uh, the way that I discipline them, train them, pray for them, all those kinds of things. So it was, it was, it was never for me just an ivory tower discussion. It was always a very practical thing as far as the life of the church and the family. You know, as uh, um, cliche as it may be, as someone who's reformed to say, John Calvin's my favorite or her, uh, you know, oh, of course it is. It's like Michael Jordan being your favorite basketball player or Tom Brady being your favorite football player or something. Um, but when you read, when you actually do read Calvin, I just want to second uh, uh, what Rich is saying. You read him and you realize this is why he is so widely read, widely studied. And there is a uh, practical element that you don't always find from such deep thinkers. And every if I'm ever preaching or reading through something, Calvin's commentaries are always helpful. And the Institutes, just like he said, is it doesn't read like you typically um, would find in a systematic theology. So that is really good. Um, so um, a high view of the sacraments, which Calvin is different than Lutheranism. He's a little different than Luther, certainly different than Roman Catholicism. Um, and uh, but yet a high view of the sacraments um, is still found in his work and in his theology. And then in our um, circles of Presbyterianism and then maybe more specifically in CREC circles, um, there is wide uh, uh, acceptance or there's an embrace of a high view of, of the sacraments. And the term that um, that I've seen you use in an essay you wrote, and I wish I had the full title of it. Um, it'll be in the description. Is it why or just do I believe in baptismal regeneration? Was that was the, the title? Well, I had been accused of teaching baptismal <laughs> regeneration. So I asked the question, do I believe in baptismal yeah. regeneration? So, uh, And you got to read about 60 pages or so to find yes, out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> very great. It's a very good essay and I'll link it below. Um, that one is a free one. That's a free PDF you can find um, on Rich's website. But um, 
where where did this come from? A reformed understanding of baptismal regeneration, and I think Calvin, you you saw that there. What what is it that you found in Calvin on this topic of baptism? Yeah. So one one thing we have to do is make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Right. I think that the terminology is really an issue here, and and this is this is a uh, this really a couple things are going on here. One is wanting to get back to the Bible's own way of talking about the sacraments and about the church. So, so that's one thing, because I think it's, it's, it's possible for theology to drift off into its own uh, form of discourse, which might get further and further removed from the Bible's own way of speaking to the fact where we find ourselves using expressions that are very different from scripture or using the same words as the Bible, but using them in a different way, or actually developing a theology that has its own vocabulary in such a way that we end up condemning biblical expressions. We wouldn't let anybody use the biblical expression uh, because we've got our own way of talking. And I think when we do that, we, we really need to uh, back up and ask, okay, let's let the Bible, you know, the Bible uh, it should be the norm and standard for our theological expression as well. A good example of this is justification. You know, if your theology simply will not allow you to say what James 2 says about faith, works, and justification, then there's a problem with your theology. Or if, you're, if you find yourself condemning an inspired apostle, then you need to you know, back up and do things differently. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that was a big part of it. Specifically with regard to baptism and its connection with regeneration, um, yes, Luther and Calvin both used the language of baptismal regeneration. This is one of those things that if you go back and, you know, sort of get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, if you go back and read the Reformers, and in particular, if you read Calvin Book 4, and then a lot of his I'd say in his commentaries and uh, particularly some of his interactions with other theologians when he is defending himself, he expresses uh, his theology of baptism in that kind of language. He'll talk about baptismal regeneration. Now, later Reformed theologians came to reject uh, baptismal regeneration. They came to reject it as a doctrine. They came to reject that language. If you were a, if you are a candidate for ordination in a large reformed denomination today, like say the PCA or something like that, or OPC is not particularly large, but let's say the OPC, uh, you, you, there's a good chance you wouldn't pass if you used Calvin's language, yeah, uh, yeah. which is interesting, uh, you know, if that's, if that's where we are. But the, one of the reasons for that, I think there's several reasons for that that I'd like to go into, but one, one reason for that is that the meaning of the term regeneration changed over time. Uh, for Calvin, to, to say that baptism, uh, to, to speak of baptismal regeneration is to say that in baptism, God brings us into the new life. So the, the, the regenesis, the, 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 the new creation life of the church and of the covenant. So for Calvin, baptismal regeneration is just as much a claim about what the church is as God's new humanity as it is a claim about what baptism is is what baptism does. Uh, that's how Calvin looks at it. Uh, later on in Reformed theology, the meaning of that term, regeneration, got narrowed and it shifted a bit. Mm -hmm. And it came to mean an irreversible principle of new life that God communicates to the soul only of his elect. And, and, and so once you're regenerated, uh, the, you, 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 you're perseverance is all but guaranteed. Right. Uh, you know, if you're, if God regenerated you, if he acted on you an irresistible grace to regenerate you, that means that you are elect and you will persevere to the end because everything follows from that. Yep. Uh, and, and that's how the term came to be used in later reformed theology. Well, then if you take that meaning of regeneration and you link it with baptism, and you say, okay, right. uh, that's, that's regeneration and baptism regenerates. Well, then what you're saying is every single baptized person is elect and will be saved. Every baptized person will persevere to the end. No theologian in the history of the church has actually taught that. So I, I, would, I would say that the, uh, the doctrine that a lot of reformed, you know, more modern reformed theologians have spent time arguing against the version of baptismal regeneration that they reject is one that I don't think any theologian in the history of the church has ever held to. Not a Roman Catholic theologian, not another reformed theologian, not Lutherans or Anglicans. It's, it's just not there. So you're kind of arguing against a, a straw man at that point. If you say, all right, baptism uh, you know, you're making the claim baptism regenerates and regeneration means this, that it is this, 
irreversible principle of life that God communicates to the souls of the elect, well, there's just nobody who's ever put those two things together in that way. So if you argue against that, I would argue against that. I have, I mean, that that that's nonsense to uh, to make the argument that every single baptized person is going to be saved. There's some kind of one to one correspondence. That's just not true. Uh, so so um, is that what, kind of, like it's, does that view sort of um, whittle it down to like a spell in a sense, sort of like they they. Oh, you must be teaching sort of like a witch's incantation. You, you do the right motions and say the right words, and it like cause and effect. Yeah, I I think that there are some people who think okay that there there is a a magical view of baptism out there, and that's what we need to argue against. Yeah. Okay, and and I, I don't doubt that like at the street level, at the popular level, there are many people who do function with that kind of view of baptism. But there's no theologian that I could name for you that has ever taught that. John Calvin didn't teach that, even though he speaks yeah. of baptismal regeneration. Thomas Aquinas didn't teach that. Augustine didn't teach that. You're just, you're just not going to find that. That's not in the Roman Catholic catechism. The Roman Catholic view of baptism has other problems, but <laughs> Roman Catholics do not say that baptism, just being baptized, guarantees your final salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, actually, and we could maybe get into this later if you want to, uh, Roman Catholics had far too weak a doctrine of baptism for Luther and Calvin. Luther and Calvin actually strengthened the efficacy of baptism uh, because the Roman Catholic doctrine was so weak. Uh, so that's that's another important thing to understand. But let me talk about a few things that happened here okay. in terms of historical movements that help us understand what's going on and why people have such a problem with the way Luther and Calvin talked about the efficacy of baptism. And I'm going to lump Luther and Calvin together for now. We can come back later and, if you want, talk about where they might differ a little bit. But on the question of baptismal efficacy, and, and, and I would say especially the question of the perpetual efficacy of baptism, what is offered and promised in baptism, Baptism, they're largely on the same page. A few technical differences, some different, some language differences, but they're they're very very similar uh, on that particular issue. So um, you had uh, at, you know after um, in Calvin's day, Calvin could speak of baptismal regeneration. If you go read the Scottish Confession of, of, of 1560, basically Knox's Confession, very high and strong doctrine of baptismal efficacy that was just common. Um, I, you can make an argument that the Westminster Confession even has a kind of doctrine of baptismal regeneration. David Wright argued that, uh, who is one of the leading uh, scholars of that era of church history. Uh, one of the Westminster divines, Cornelius Burgess, wrote an, an essay or actually a book uh, called The Baptismal Regeneration of Elect Infants. I think there was a more full title than that, but that, and that's an interesting read. Uh, he does things a little bit differently than Calvin, but obviously is willing to connect baptism to regeneration. But I think the Arminian controversy, uh, and then especially the rise of Enlightenment rationalism, and then later pietism had a very withering effect on baptismal efficacy. The Enlightenment wanted to be about pure reason. And so to an Enlightenment rationalist, the sacraments do look like magic. Mm -hmm. uh, how can a bodily action of pouring water over someone cause a spiritual change? How can that be? The, the, to the Enlightenment mind, there's no rational explanation for that. So the Enlightenment wants pure reason. And so the sacraments have to be devalued into mere symbols that make us think, you know, that make us use our reason yeah. to think about certain things. And so that so this view kind of creeps in that the sacraments become an intellectual exercise. Um, and then pietism comes along. So you've got enlightenment rationalism, you've got pietism, which really gets into high gear with the second great awakening beginning in the, in the 19th century. And this is when you really have a shift in America as the, as America is moving westward and settling the frontier. And of course the, the church planting from the older, more established denominations like the Presbyterians and Anglicans can't keep up. And so it's the Methodists and especially the Baptists who are out there uh, planting the churches and all that. But uh, piet so pietism arose if, if enlightenment if the Enlightenment was about pure reason, pietism tended to be about pure feeling. Well, then it becomes all about what do I feel in my baptism? This, this really took its toll on infant baptism because infants can't be expected to have any kind of emotional experience uh, when they're baptized. I mean, they usually either sleep through it or cry through it. So <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't do anything. If, if everything is about pure feeling, 
you know, this kind of pietistic view, well, then the sacrament is going to be defined by what it makes me feel in that moment. Okay, so baptism becomes what 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 was my experience of baptism like? What was I feeling? And, and if I wasn't feeling the right things, maybe I need to get baptized again. Uh, you know, when I take the Lord's Supper, it's all about my feeling, and it becomes very introspective. I'm going to rake myself over the coals and and self-flagellate at the Lord's table. And this is not this is going to be more like tomb than table because it can't be a celebration. I need to make myself feel as bad as possible because it's about that experience as I remember what Jesus did for me. Okay, there's a, there's, there's a place for that kind of confession of sin, maybe perhaps even for that kind of introspection, but the Lord's table is not it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you had enlightenment rationalism, which said the sacrament, sacramental efficacy basically looks like magic. You had pietism that really shifted the focus of the sacraments from how God works to how I feel. And I would say, so let me also just throw this out there as a way of kind of thinking about how these debates have um, fallen out historically. I think the basic watershed, if I can use a pun, the basic watershed when it comes to baptism is those on the one hand who see baptism as God's work. And so the question is, what did God mean when he baptized me? What was God doing when he baptized me versus those who see baptism as a human work? What was I doing for God? What did I feel or experience when I got baptized. Right. And, and that, that, that to me is the most basic divide in all of these debates uh, over baptism. Is it God's work or is it man's work? If you establish that it's God's work, and this is really the key thing, then everything else about baptismal efficacy and even how that relates to the baptism of, of infants follows from that. If baptism is seen as God's gift, if baptism is seen as a human work, well, then you are going to end up in a very different place. Um, And then you've got those who maybe sort of hover in the middle. They see it as God's work, but only symbolically. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, I've got to do something to make my baptism effective. And in the case of an infant, you know, maybe later on in life, we, you know, you've got some reformed theologians who talk about baptizing children with a hope that someday in the future, uh, they'll come to faith. And you can see why Baptists would say, well, then let's just wait till later and and baptize after that thing has Mm -hmm. happened. Um, But I I think that's the basic divide. Those who see baptism as God's work versus those who see baptism as man's work. Um, So uh, you see performed baptismal regeneration similarly or pretty much the same as efficacy would you say that that's kind of all in the same i would yeah so let me give you a couple of of um what these are illustrations that i've picked up and used many times that i think can be helpful uh, in thinking about how a rite or a ritual or a sacrament can be effective we protestants do not say that marriage is a sacrament Right. So a, a wedding is not a sacrament, mm-hmm. but a wedding is an efficacious ritual. You have two people, a man and a woman, who they wake up one morning and they are single. And then they go through this ceremony we call a marriage. And they come out the other side of that ceremony. And now they are no longer two, but one. And when Jesus is teaching on marriage, he says, let not man separate what God has joined together. God acts through the marriage ceremony, through that ritual to make the two one. And prior to that wedding ceremony, they were to sleep together be fornication. Now it's a privilege and an obligation. Uh, prior to that uh, to that wedding ceremony. They're two single people. They go through this marriage ceremony. Now they're married and they have all of the privileges and responsibilities that come with the married state. She gets a new name. Uh, They have new, they enter into new offices, these offices of husband and wife. Uh, So, so there is a real change that takes place that God ratifies a covenant between the two of them. God creates a covenant bond between the two of them. And that's what Jesus says, man should not break that covenant that God has created. Now, marriage is not a sacrament, but marriage is an effective, there's an effective ritual there. And and God acts uh, to form that bond between the man and the woman. Now, have you ever been to a wedding grant where, you know, you went to the ceremony, you witnessed the ceremony, and then you left and you wondered, Gee, I, I wonder if they are really married. I wonder if they're really husband. Is it possible they could still be two single people? No, 
I, I mean, you might wonder whether or not they're going to stay together. Okay. You might wonder whether or not they're going to, whether or not this marriage is going to last, but there's no question that they're married. No right. question. Right. Uh, nobody goes to a marriage and then leaves wondering whether or not they got married, not least in any situation I've ever heard of. We know that they've got a new status, a change has taken place through this ritual. Uh, another example of this is ordination. And again, we Protestants do not hold that uh, that, that, that ordination is a sacrament, and yet ordination is an effective ritual. Again, you have a man who is a member of the church, and he's you know, obviously he has a number of steps he has to pass through to get to this point, such as examination by a session in presbytery and and called by the congregation, all, you know, several things that lead up to this, just as there are things that lead up to a wedding ceremony. But when it comes to his ordination ceremony, the laying on of hands, uh, you have a man who is a church member and who goes through this ceremony and comes out the other side as a pastor or an elder. Uh, and so he has, he has a change of status within the congregation. He has new roles and responsibilities. He has a new authority uh, that, that, that comes with this office that has been granted to him in ordination. And so it'd be the same kind of thing. I mean, nobody would go to an ordination service and then walk out thinking, gee, I wonder if that took, I wonder if he's really a pastor. <laughs> no, he, he is a pastor. He may be a good pastor. He may be a bad pastor. He may right. be a faithful pastor, maybe an unfaithful pastor, but he is a pastor. His, his status has been changed. He's got a new title, new office, new privileges, new responsibilities, new authority, uh, new standing within the uh, within the community. And so I would make the argument that if uh, a marriage ceremony and an ordination ceremony can have a kind of efficacy, and, and all Protestants would admit that, I think, mm -hmm. virtually all, I, would, I think, would admit that, uh, then why not baptism? Right. Why are we so... Uh, why, why, why is it so often that we spend so much time talking about what baptism does not do and so little time talking about what God does do in our baptisms? If you just read the New Testament passages that, and I, obviously there's a lot of passages that don't mention baptism by name that are about baptism, but if you just go by the passages that uh, that mention baptism, you can't, you can't, unless you have a prejudice against the view, again, because of, say, the pure reason of the Enlightenment or the pure feeling of pietism, unless you have a prejudice against baptismal efficacy from the outset, like it's a presupposition from the outset, you're going to come away from reading the text in the New Testament about baptism certain that something really important and momentous and significant happens when a person is baptized. You know, Peter says, at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, he tells us flat out what happens in baptism. Forgiveness will be granted, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right. That, that, and, and that, I mean, really, you could say the rest of the New Testament is really just kind of unpacking those two gifts that are promised in baptism. Yeah. Uh, but again and again and again, we see this in Acts chapter 22. Ananias says to, to Saul, to Paul, rise up, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that, that's, that's, the, that's the biblical way of speaking about baptism. In Romans 6, it's being baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, that in baptism, so so I've used the marriage analogy just a minute ago. Well, in Romans chapter six, I think Paul's doing something very similar. In Romans chapter six, Paul is indicating that baptism is our marital union with Christ. In baptism, right. we are united to Christ. Baptism is a wedding ceremony. I mean, because you become part of the bride of Christ, don't individualize that, but you become part of the bride of Christ. You are united to Christ. Christ is your husband. You have a marital covenant with Christ. Uh, because you've been baptized. That's really what, what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 6. You're married to Christ, so live like it. You're united to Christ. You're one with Christ, so be a faithful spouse to Christ. Be faithful right. to Christ. Live as those who are dead to sin and alive to righteousness. And then we could go on and on and on. Uh, Peter even had the boldness to say, baptism now saves you. Okay. And again, if we can't speak that way, the problem is with our theology. If we cannot replicate the uh, apostolic way of speaking about baptism, that's a huge problem. So I, that's a really good, um, really good point to make and make and sort of transition here. I'm happy that you, you listed several of those um, passages. There's, there's two more in my mind that I think um, 
force us to think about this more biblically and and in more in line with this um, view that you're expressing. And that would be Titus 3, 5, mm -hmm. um, the washing of regeneration. I don't know how a New Testament Christian could think of that in any other way than baptism. There, what right. other washings right. are we given on this right. side of the cross except baptism? And then, um, and then of course, you've already mentioned how the new creation and regeneration and this new order, new world, all this new covenant is, those are synonymous oftentimes. Um, Colossians 2, uh, 10 and 11 as well, where the circumcision of Christ is baptism in which you have been um, crucified and are made alive. You know, that it's all, in Paul's mind, it seems all linked together. There's no problem. They would just talk this way. And um, so... So you, you did kind of already talk about uh, it strikes a nerve, um, but what I've seen as I've tried to learn this, you know, more re my, my history and studying these things is just the last few years, um, but it does seem to be a semantical problem. And you already talked about the narrowing of um, uh, the idea of the, you know, the word regeneration, it, the, the meaning is just narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and, you know, why that happened or or who did that that's a long probably a long conversation but um why is it important to recover like how how can we recover a more biblical language but not fall into the um the a misunderstanding or fall into error when it comes to that right you know so i guess people people probably want to be biblical but then also don't want to um become those who do believe in just a mechanical yeah, you know, understanding yeah. of baptism. Yeah. Well, a couple of, well, let me go back to, to something you said. I'm going to come to that question because that's important, Grant. But uh, let me let me back up uh, to, to, to something else you said, like Titus chapter 3, 5, the washing of regeneration. How can anybody read that and think about anything other than your baptism? Okay, well, I will tell you uh, what, what people do with passages like the ones I cited or the Titus 3 passage is they will say, well, see, actually, um, that is this is what baptism symbolizes. Yeah. So baptism symbolizes regeneration. That's what that's what or baptism symbolizes union with Christ. So they insert you know symbolic language into mm -hmm. that. They, they 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 take the literal language and they turn it into into symbol, symbolic language. Uh, so uh, it, Peter's not really saying that baptism forgives your sins in Acts chapter two. He's saying it symbolizes forgiveness. Okay, uh, and and the route that that uh, that I, I think is very commonly taken is basically to say that there are two baptisms. There is a uh, water baptism that everybody who's part of the visible church has received, and then there is a spirit baptism that the elect receive. That's invisible. It's obviously just a hidden work of the spirit, mm -hmm. and probably closely identified in a lot of people's minds with regeneration. Well, there's a lot of problems with that particular way of, of, of reading the Bible. One is you have assumed from the outset what you need to prove, which is that the passages are symbolic. You can't wedge the, 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 the idea that these are all, that all these texts are speaking symbolically without some kind of argument. And why do we have texts that again and again and again speak this very direct way about baptismal efficacy if baptism is merely a symbol? If it's just supposed to symbolize something, so that, that's one. There's there's a hermeneutical problem there. Mm -hmm. um, you're basically taking your theology and imposing it on the text, saying, "Well, I know the text can't mean what it says, so we've got to make it say something different." So obviously, this is just symbolic. Well, it's not obvious at all that it's symbolic language. Um, I've I've already given you examples of uh, of rituals or rites where God acts to uh, to cause something to happen such as the wedding ceremony and, and an ordination ceremony. So again, why not baptism? Why, uh, why can't God act in baptism in an efficacious way? So, so that, that's, that's one thing I think has got to be kept in mind. You cannot write these passages off as merely symbolic. Uh, that's reading something into the text that's simply not there. And if this was going to cause so much error and confusion, why doesn't God just say, uh, be baptized to symbolize what's happened internally or something. I mean, we just, the, the Bible never does that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is in Ephesians 4, Paul says there is one baptism. So I, I do not think it works to divide baptism into two. Uh, 
one for the visible church, one for the invisible church, or one for the covenant and one for the elect or something That's like really that. Also, this is one baptism. Uh, and that baptism is the baptism that Jesus gives to his church, that God gives to his church. Um, Martin Luther, I thought, was, was very clever. He said, you know, instead of speaking of John the Baptist, we ought to speak of Jesus the Baptist, or even God the Baptist, because Jesus, you know, that, that's what John says. There's one coming after me who will baptize you. He'll, I'm baptizing you merely with water. He's going to baptize you with water and fire with the Spirit. He's going to baptize you with the Spirit. Mm-hmm. And uh, but But what is that? spirit baptism. Well, I've, I think it's water baptism. That's the whole point is that uh, the spirit works through the water. Uh, that, that, that's, again, offensive to those who, because of enlightenment rationalism, are committed to pure reason or because of pietism are committed to pure feeling. But that, that's the reality. Uh, the, the spirit works through the water. Uh, that, and that, that was Luther's question. How can water do such wonders? Well, it's not the water. It's God acting in and through the water. God acting in and through this ritual of baptism. In 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul talks about um, being baptized uh, in, into the spirit, or he says uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, he's using that body illustration, one body, many mm-hmm. members. That's where he uses the language of, of spirit baptism. It's very clear. That's actually talking about the visible church anyway. I mean, it's talking about the body of Christ, which is visible and tan. I mean, his whole point is the visible community. And his whole point is that you've all shared in the same baptism. If there are two baptisms and only some, you know, everybody's received one kind of baptism, but only some people have received the second kind of baptism, that creates a division within the body, which is the very kind of thing Paul's arguing against. Paul can argue for the unity of the body on the basis that we've all experienced the same spirit baptism, spirit slash water baptism. So that's really, really important, I think, to keep in view. We, we cannot divide baptism into two. There's one baptism. God acts, God works in that baptism to bring us into his church, to bring us into the body of Christ, to make us members of his family. In baptism, God promises us the forgiveness of sins through the sprinkling of Christ's blood, and he promises us the gift of the Holy Spirit to renew us. That's what God does in baptism. Now, here's the thing. And this, this is getting to what you, I think, were um, the, the, maybe the question you're raising. If not, we can, we can revisit it. But the question then is, well, what do we do? We have to receive this baptism, this baptismal gift that God is giving to us in the water. We have to receive that gift with faith. And if you do not receive that gift with faith, well, I use the illustration of ordination and marriage. There are some pastors, they get ordained, they really do enter into the pastorate, but they're evil men. They're wicked mm-hmm. men. They deny what the pastorate is all about. They deny what their ordination was all about. Ultimately, they must be defrocked and have their pastoral status revoked. Same, we know the same kind of thing can happen with marriage. Sadly, there are marriages uh, that do not last. Uh, and let's just say, uh, for um, obviously have a lot of different ways, but let's just say for the sake of the argument, let's say you have one spouse who commits adultery and is not repentant. Uh, the other spouse has the freedom to divorce the right. adulterer and move on. <laughs> uh, the, you know, so uh, there is that. That's the, when 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 the covenant is broken in that way. The covenant is a conditional relationship, and so there are certain sins that are so egregious that they they violate that covenant that was formed, and then the relationship can be terminated. Well, again, I would say it's, it is the same. Uh, there's an analogy there with baptism. In baptism, we are united to Christ. We become branches uh, on the vine of Christ. We become branches on the olive tree of the covenant, John 15, Romans 11. But if we are not faithful, if we do not receive the gift of baptism with an ongoing faith, uh, if we turn away from Christ, if we commit spiritual adultery, he can divorce us. We can be uh, cut off of the vine that is Christ and thrown into the trash heap to be burned. We can be uh, like those olive branches Paul talks about that are broken out of the tree and, and cast away. That's why Paul says, consider both the kindness and severity of God. Uh, because, yes, you, you were, he says to the Gentiles, you were wild olive branches grafted into the covenant tree of Israel. But uh, anyone who's on this tree and is not faithful can be broken out. And that's why we have a church discipline process that ultimately results in excommunication. Baptism is your incommunication 
It brings you into the communion of the church, into communion with the triune God in an official, covenantal, formal way. Excommunication would be casting you out of the church, excommunicating you from fellowship with the Father, Son, and Spirit. So, there, so, so baptism is... Uh, efficacious. It does change our status, our standing. Right. There are gifts that are promised and offered to us in baptism. But if we do not receive those gifts in faith with an enduring faith, an obedient faith, a living faith, then those gifts can be taken away from us. And that is why you have, you have baptized people all throughout the New Testament. And you look at how Paul describes the, the, the church. So he'll say, I'm writing to the saints in, right. uh, in Corinth. Uh, you know, called and and uh, and he'll he'll give all of these descriptions of of who they are, of their identity, and then later in the letter he'll say, "But uh, if you don't continue in the faith, um, but you'll, you'll be cast you out." Is, one of you sleeping with his mother-in-law, and yeah. you guys need to put him out of the church. That put was him out a of called, church. and yeah, that's a called yeah. saintly one. So, so <laughs> baptismal efficacy, yes. Possibility of apostasy. Yes, and that is the tension that we live within in the Christian life. Uh, and so, how do we how do we persevere in what was given to us in baptism? We cling to Christ. Right. But understanding what God did for you in your baptism helps you to do that. It reinforces your identity. It reminds you of God's graciousness to you. Uh, it, it's 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 a gift God has given to you, and it's the foundation on which you build your Christian life: union with Christ. You know, it's interesting when. Those who understand, um, you know, baptism uh, or, or effectual baptism to only mean a, a spiritual reality, um, separated from the 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 physical, you know, and the ritual, um, will point to physical uh, fruit as evidence. So they they don't ditch the physical altogether, because you say, well, how do you know that person's been actually spiritually baptized, or how do you know that they've truly been regenerated? They'll point to fruit, typically, right? It'll it'll be well. They used to be a this kind of a person, and now they're this kind of the person, and so they're still. It's inescapable to to give some sort of like for the for the physical to play a part in uh, our salvation in and how we know that we are part of uh, that community in God. Well, the Bible is a physical book. Yeah. And preaching is a physical thing too. I mean, you can ask the same. You can ask the same. How is preaching efficacious? All right. How is it that uh, sound waves that that, that that emanate from a preacher uh, can travel down my ear canal, strike my eardrum, uh, and and then that can somehow create some kind of lasting spiritual change in my life? How can sound waves do so much? We might ask. Powerful. Just like we can ask, how can water do? How can bread and wine do so much? How can water do so much? Well, it's because God works. The, the, these. So one of the big issues in the Reformation, and you, you know, this has been um, something that I think this is something that the uh, Reformed Church has somewhat lost and needs to recover. One of the big issues in the Reformation is, uh, you know, for Luther, the question was not just how can God be gracious to me, a sinner. But the question was, where can I find this gracious God? Because the late medieval answer that the Roman Catholic Church was giving to that question is, well, seek God in relics, seek God in pilgrimages, seek God in praying to the saints, seek God in the rosary, seek God in penance. Mm -hmm. And Luther, and then after him, Calvin come along and say, no, we must seek God where he has promised to be found. And God has not promised to meet us in relics. God has not promised to meet us in pilgrimages to Rome or to the Holy Land. God has not promised to meet us in this fictitious sacrament of penance, which we probably should talk about penance here in just a minute. But God has promised to meet us in baptism, in the word, and at the table. And so if we're going to seek God where he has promised to be found, we seek him in these means of grace. And I think that that's, that's something, again, that I think uh, needs to be uh, recovered and made central once again to the life of the church, to the, to the Christian life. So um, I had another question um, and maybe the penance comment connects with it. You could, you can tell me if I'm connecting two things accurately or not. Um, but is, is it, is it true that Calvin even thought of regeneration, not as kind of this, um, you know, past tense uh, punctiliar thing that happened but actually an ongoing yeah. he sort of 
correlated it with what we today would understand as sanctification. And then yeah, Calvin uses that term regeneration as kind of all encompassing for the beginning and progress of spiritual life. So right. uh, it, it, um, it's obviously this new life that's given to us. But the, the fact that this is ongoing, yes, Calvin will use the term regeneration even for that. Yeah, let me talk about penance here for just a minute, because again, I, I think another issue, I've, I've talked about some of the obstacles to the language of baptismal regeneration. And again, my, my interest in this, as I, as I said, it is historical. It's also biblical. I want to be able to talk the way the Bible talks. And the Bible describes baptism as the washing of regeneration. Uh, I would like to be able to talk that way, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but so how can I do that? What, what kind of understanding, uh, do you have to have of the washing part and the regeneration part for that to work? Another thing that you will encounter, another obstacle you will encounter is people will say, well, baptismal regeneration is the Roman Catholic view. And so we Protestants have to take a different view. Well, again, it is true that there are Roman Catholic theologians that use the language of baptismal regeneration. Again, they mean something different by it. And this is what's really interesting. At the time of the Reformation, uh, the uh, Roman scholastic theologians, they had a very highly you know, worked out doctrine of baptism. Luther and Calvin came along and just smashed it. Mm -hmm. The Roman Catholic view went something like this. And this is basically still the Roman Catholic view today. When you get baptized, original sin and perhaps all sins committed up to that point in your life are washed away. But for any sin you commit after baptism, the way to deal with that post-baptismal sin is through penance. And so you go confess it to your priest. He'll prescribe a certain set of penances for you to do, depending on the magnitude of the sin. You go perform those penances, and then you can be assured that you are forgiven, that you're restored to right standing. Now, several things. One is you can see why somebody might want to... Uh, chance it and try to delay baptism till their deathbed. Okay. Right. Baptism is only going to wash away uh, sins, original sin and sin committed up to this point in my life. Maybe I should just delay baptism. And there were at least a handful of cases where that kind of thing happened in the early church. Uh, but the Roman Catholic church obviously didn't want people doing that. Uh, they, they wanted to baptize babies that, you know, they wanted, they wanted people getting baptized, um, not waiting till their deathbed to do it. And uh, so the way they did that is that, well, we'll we, we have a way for you to deal with, with sin after you get baptized. Just go to your priest, confess it, and he'll prescribe penance for you to do. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Luther and Calvin both come along and they say penance. There's nothing about penance in the Bible. Certainly not doing, I mean, obviously uh, penance in the sense of, of contrition over sin is perfectly appropriate. Right. But the, the Roman Catholic sacrament of penance, in a sense of certain actions performed to restore status, mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing like that in Scripture, nothing like the Roman Catholic system. And what's really interesting is that Luther and Calvin both argued against penance in an identical way. They said the reason you don't need to do penance is because the efficacy of your baptism persists. The efficacy of your baptism is perpetual. So Calvin's really clear about this. He says, when you are baptized, mm -hmm. you ought to consider yourself forgiven, not just for past sins, present sins, but there's a promise of future forgiveness as well. I mean, God's not going to forgive sins before you commit them. I, I, I suppose yeah. God doesn't do funny things with time like that, but there's a, there's a perpetual promise of forgiveness made to you in the waters of baptism. And so instead of penance, what Luther and Calvin pointed to is absolution, which is something that took place in the liturgy. And I, I, you know, my church has this, I would guess, you know, your church probably has this. A lot of our churches, I think, very thankfully have recovered this from the, right. uh, from the liturgies of the mm -hmm. Protestant Reformation, that when we gather for worship, one of the first things we do is we confess our sin, and then we hear a pastor declare, and if we use Calvin's words, take heart, your sins are forgiven. And Calvin's really clear about this, that absolution is a renewal of baptism. Absolution has reference to baptism. So what is happening when the pastor declares your forgiveness of sins is he is reapplying and uh, re-announcing the promise of forgiveness that was made to you at your baptism. Yeah. And that's how that ought to be understood. And, and so it's this really beautiful system 
that the reformers, uh, I think, I, I think it's clearly derived from scripture, but that they put in place of this Roman Catholic system that had people constantly doubting, you know, have I done enough penance to have my sins forgiven? Uh, it, it, it caused a, a problem of constantly wrestling with assurance and obviously a legalistic or works righteousness mentality. Right. If I'm going to maintain my status through doing penance, uh, that, that throws the whole Christian life up in the air. It's Luther and Calvin said, no, the promise that God made to you in your baptism is right. perpetual. The Westminster Confession talks about this uh, when it says that the efficacy of baptism is not limited to the time of its administration. Okay, this is what I think they mean because every other Reformed confession says this. And Calvin says this, and Luther says this, the efficacy of baptism is not limited, confined to the time of your baptism, but continues for the whole of your life. So if you were baptized as an infant and now you're 90 years old, you're still reclaiming that baptismal promise. Every time you sin and confess your sin and claim God's forgiveness, every time you confess your sin and hear a pastor pronounce forgiveness, you're claiming that baptismal promise that God made to you decades before. Um, that baptismal promise still covers you. Um, the, 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 so, so Luther and Calvin both argued that the problem with the Roman Catholic doctrine of baptism is not that it is too strong, but it, it is too weak. Yeah. Baptism is durable enough. The, the promises made in baptism are durable enough to withstand our sinning. Um, I've had, that's very, very good. And this, I've, this story I've heard several times and there's a family member who, um, who had, this was their, their story. And it was, you know, I was, you know, I think it was Lutheran. Uh, oh, I was baptized as an infant and then confirmed. You know, I, I did all the catechism and stuff. But then high school, college, walked away and all this stuff. And then um, and then I did come back. And you know, they're you know believer now and that sort of thing. You know, what, what do you say about that? I was like, well, I guess it's, I guess it's still working. <laughs> there you Just go. Yeah. What you said, the baptism is still yeah. God didn't forget his promises okay. didn't fail right. or anything. And um, what it seems like everything you explained there, uh, as far as what the reformers uh, declared in this absolution is again, not, not a spell, not a, an incantation or whatever. It's a declaration of uh, God's promises. So again, going back to what is your view of baptism? Is it what God is doing or what we do? Right. And so, right. um, what, what you were saying with the idea of penance is it was going back to you are the one who is making, you know, all of these things to make um, salvation effectual in your life. And the reformers returned that back to the emphasis being on God. Yeah. So let me take this one step further. So Luther and Calvin both argued for what I would call the completeness of baptism. Okay. The complete, so baptism does not need to be supplemented with penance, the, as in the Roman Catholic system. In, in, in baptism, God has made you a perpetual and abiding promise of forgiveness that you can continue. So, so this is why for Luther and Calvin, there's a very real sense in which the whole Christian life is all about remembering your baptism. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anytime you sin, Calvin says, call to mind your baptism, the promise made to you there. Uh, that, that, that is exactly right. However, I do think that there was a flaw in the way both of them uh, dealt with this. And it's interesting to see how Protestants have, re have responded to that flaw. Okay. I don't know if you want to take the podcast here or not, but I'm going to take it there anyway. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Cause I think, I think this is all connected. Yeah. Uh, you recover this strong doctrine of baptismal efficacy, the abiding uh, efficacy of baptism over the whole course of your life. Okay. So baptism is complete. Okay. Well, um, uh, there were some Protestants who uh, introduced uh, confirmation later yeah. on. Uh, and, and so confirmation was used to mark the transition point when a baptized child becomes a communing member, a communing adult, usually was the case, uh, in the church. And I would say, now wait just a second. Mm -hmm. Is confirmation in some way... Is, is, it, is it creating a penance-like system where now you're saying that and maybe, penance, maybe confirmation is not going to be called a sacrament the way Roman Catholics call penance a sacrament, but by adding confirmation to the mix, are we saying that baptism didn't really bring you into the church? Right. Uh, the baptism does need to be supplemented with something else to make it complete, to complete your membership and your, your, you know, your, statting, your, your standing or your status. Uh, in the church. 
Um, so I think the most um, logical and I, I, biblical, I think you can make biblical arguments for this, not just log logical argument, you can make biblical arguments for this, but is for this strong doctrine of baptismal efficacy to be followed by pedo communion. And so a child who is baptized in infancy uh, then would begin to take, would begin to partake of the Lord's table with us, uh, just as that child is physically able to take the bread and, uh, and the wine. And uh, to, so I, I, I see Pato communion as, I mean, you can make arguments for Pato communion in its own right, based on right. Old Testament uh, meals uh, and festivals. You can make it, make an argument for Pato communion in its own right, based on things the New Testament says about mm -hmm. the Lord's Supper or about the, uh, about the status of the, the covenant child in the church. A uh, lot, lot of different arguments you could make for pedo communion, but I also think there's there's a, uh, a baptismal argument to be made for pedo communion. It follows from mm -hmm. uh, from the fact that these children are baptized. Of course, they belong at the table. They've been brought into the church. They're part of the body of Christ. How can you deny them the body of Christ? Right. Yeah, that's and, and I think that'd be another way of, of demonstrating the completeness of baptism. It's not like you get baptized and then there's some other hoop you got to jump through in order to get to the Lord's table. Mm -hmm. and, and for adults, it typically works that way. But for children, uh, it calls into question whether or not their baptism is really complete. And I would argue that it is. Hey, going back to, again, it's one baptism. There's not a different right. one, one for baptism. adults, a different right. one for infants. Right. right. And any kind of argument somebody might try to make for confirmation is going to be very thin biblically. There's not... There's, there's a, the Bible doesn't have any uh, anything like a ritual confirmation for children who were uh, brought up in the covenant. So, yeah, um, probably be a little bit of a sidebar to, to to look into why the Jewish tradition of bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs has come has come to be. But that's it's probably a little too far away from what we're trying to talk about. Um, maybe I another like podcast sometime. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Go down those roads. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, that sounds like their version of confirmation. Um, but uh, you you lumped Luther and Calvin together, and you said maybe later we could talk about it. Well, are there any distinctions between uh, uh, Luther and Calvin's view on this baptismal regeneration? Did they talk about it a little differently? And is it that important to make sure there are uh, distinctions made? Well, I will tell you this. Lutherans think that there's a big difference. Okay. Uh, Lutherans tend to be very critical of the Calvinistic tradition at just this point because mm -hmm. they say, oh, you Calvinists, you know, you're a bunch of, of they'll accuse Calvinists of being rationalists and they'll say that Calvinists don't really have a, uh, a, a strong doctrine of sacramental efficacy and that Calvinists just reduce mm -hmm. the sacraments to symbols or memorials. Um, Maybe that's fair uh, across. And, and that, may, that, that may be a fair criticism of, of some branches of the Reformed Church. It's not fair of Calvin himself, but Calvin had to deal with yeah. that criticism in his own day from Lutherans and where they should have been allies. In fact, some of Calvin's strongest language about baptismal efficacy comes when he is responding to Lutheran criticisms, particularly from Westfall. So, um Yes, I, I, I would say when it comes to baptismal efficacy, while Calvin and Luther or Calvinists and or let's just say those who want to be you know, very closely uh, aligned with Calvin himself on this question and mm -hmm. Luther and Lutherans, uh, they use a lot of the same language to describe baptism. It may not always be identical, but there's a great deal of similarity when it comes to mm -hmm. baptismal efficacy. So both Calvin and Luther are very much at home with that language of baptismal regeneration, identifying baptism with the washing of regeneration in Titus 3.5. So um, they, they both will use very real, what I would call realistic language and biblical language for uh, what happens in baptism. That's awesome. Once you move out from that, though, there are some some differences when it comes to um, the warrant that is given for uh, baptizing the children of believers. Luther and Calvin differ quite significantly. Calvin's got a much more developed argument for infant baptism based on the covenant, yeah. whereas for Luther, it's kind of like, well, the Great Commission says baptize nations and children are part of the nation, you know, are mm -hmm. Members of a nation, so baptize them. Okay. There's not there's not a lot of 
uh, really deep or detailed. And, and maybe in, in Luther's day, he didn't need to provide really deep and right. detailed argumentation for the inclusion of infants. But Calvin does that. Calvin, you know, basically you have this whole covenantal substructure in Calvin right. uh, that uh, then provides the foundation on which the baptism of infants is based. It's a very, it's a covenantal argument based on the uh, the way the Old Testament and the New Testament relate to one another and God's covenant promises going back to Abraham and how the covenant promises always include generations and uh, what the what the Bible actually says about the status of children uh, in various places. Um, so for Calvin, it's just a much more sophisticated argument when it comes to uh, arguing for infant baptism. And, and there are some other differences. Um, I talked about how baptismal efficacy is clearly taught in scripture. Well, there are also warnings about apostasy. Uh, I think Luther is actually much more, um, much more straightforward in how he deals with those warnings about apostasy. For Luther, it's like, yes, there are people get baptized, uh, they're in the faith, they're in the church, and then they fall away. Mm -hmm. Calvin kind of has this meandering discussion of apostasy. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's, it's very, very nuanced. It tries to do justice to a lot of biblical material. He does get there. I would say Calvin also has a doctrine of apostasy uh, that, that is, that is in the end, quite similar to Luther's. He just takes a much longer way to get there. And of course, that's something that has been lost. What eventually happened with a changing definition of regeneration later on, where regeneration gets narrowed, is then the argument becomes, well, only the elect ever receive any kind of blessing from God in the covenant. Yeah. The covenant's really only made with the elect, and there may be people who are part of the visible church who are not elect, but they're not, they never really received anything from God. And I, I don't think that's a good, that's a good way of dealing with the biblical material. Yeah. The Bible talks about all covenant members sharing certain covenant blessings in common, right. but covenants are always conditional. And the condition, of course, is faith. So you have to persevere in the faith to uh, maintain those blessings. And in the New Testament, you know, there's all kinds of if statements, if clauses in, in the New Testament, that kind of thing, all kinds of warnings that the New Testament gives us that point us that direction. But the warnings make no sense if nothing has really been received. The warnings presuppose real blessings have been given. And now the way to keep those blessings is to persevere in the faith, keep clinging to Christ. If you abandon Christ, those blessings will be taken from you. And we can step back from that and say, well, in terms of God's sovereignty, all those that God has foreordained to final salvation will persevere to the end in the faith. But there will be some who do break covenant, who apostatize, who have to be put out of the church. There are false professors within the church. There are hypocrites within the church. There are people whose faith does not take root uh, and go very deep. And so it, it, it withers away when it gets put to the test. Uh, there are people who believe for a time. The Bible talks about a kind of temporary faith. And so we have to uh, do justice to all of those things as well. Um, that's, that's awesome. And you just... Um it's uh this is this is helpful you keep mentioning just a little bit of another question you know that um i know reform people would have pertaining to this and you just mentioned god's for nation for for those who would persevere to the end and i think yeah if you're being biblical you're you look at all these verses on baptism and you realize oh wow there is quite a bit of efficacy here um my view of baptism needs to you know needs to go up but then you come to the understanding in scripture of God's sovereignty and his, uh, you know, providence over all things, and obviously including salvation. Um, and then that's one of the most well-known things about reformed theology, right? It's the, the predestinating grace of God to, you know, uh, to save his elect. How do those, how do those two things marry together? You, you sort of, you know, touched on it just now a little yeah, bit, but yeah. to to calm the nerves a little of the the strong yeah, yeah. Calvinists. Well, well, let me say this. I mean, if you want a more complete explanation, I've addressed this in a few different places. One one place you could go to if you want to do a little bit of reading and, and, and get a more detailed explanation of this, how does baptismal efficacy, the possibility of apostasy and covenant conditionality, how does all of that relate to God's sovereignty and salvation. Uh, there was a book put out, it's been many years now, called The Federal Vision. I've got a couple essays in there. One is actually on infant baptism and the decline of infant, why infant baptism uh, 
uh, fell into decline in America. The, Charles Hodge addressed this in an alarming article he wrote in the uh, in the 19th century about how infant baptism was basically falling by the wayside. And basically in that article, I argue that infant baptism makes no sense unless you have a high view of the efficacy of baptism. If baptism is a mere symbol or if it's something that we do uh, to show our faith to God, then no, it, doesn't, it makes no sense to baptize mm -hmm. an infant. But if baptism is God's gift, well, an infant can receive a gift. An infant can have a relationship with God, just like that infant has a relationship with uh, with his parents. So, so that's one article I've got in that uh, in that book. But I've also got another article. I think it's the last article in the book, and it's on Hebrews six okay. and the doctrine uh, of apostasy that Hebrews six and really the whole book of Hebrews gives us. And I developed that. And at the very end of it, I connect all of that with God's sovereignty in salvation. You know, basically to say, look, this is how it all integrates together because the same Bible that tells us that uh, that the elect. Uh, will all persevere to the end also gives us warnings about apostasy. So how can that right. be? And I, so one way of getting at this is to remember Deuteronomy 29, 29, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says uh, that the revealed things belong to us and to our children. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. Well, election is one of God's secret things. It, mm -hmm. God's decree is always secret until it happens. That's that's simply how it is. The covenant belongs to us and to our children. And so we have to make our judgments and our evaluations and our understanding it comes is derives from the covenant. We know that God is sovereign over all things. We know that God has predestined all things. That God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, that he's predestined some to eternal life and he's appointed others to a final judgment. Uh, but that gets worked out historically through the covenant. Yeah. What so what I find interesting is that the Bible does not mind giving us this tension. It's kind of it's the tension that Calvinists a lot of times will talk about uh, the tension that exists between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. We know that both are true. That God is absolutely sovereign over all things, and yet my choices are free and responsible. Kind of like we're characters in a story, and God's the author. And if you were to take any story, you know, if you were to ask. Uh, you know, why does why did Edmund in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe betray his siblings? Well, you could say he did it because he wanted Turkish delight or he was feeling left out from his siblings and was angry with them. You could answer that in terms of Edmund and his psychology and his decision making within the story, why there's a logic to it. You could also answer that in terms of, well, that's how C.S. Lewis wrote the story. That's what right. C.S. Lewis foreordained to happen. Okay. Both are true. It operates on both levels. Edmund makes choices as a character within the story, and he's responsible for those choices. And all of his choices are foreordained or predestined by the author of Edmund's story, the author of everything that happens in Narnia, which is C.S. Lewis. And that's, that's, a, that's an illustration that I think gets at. I think it helps us understand what the Bible, you know, Paul talks about the potter and the clay. I think we could say the author and the story just as well. In fact, Paul, uh, um, David actually does that in Psalm 139. All the days of my life were written in a book, in your book ahead of time. So he's basically saying, God, you've pre-written my story. That's what he's saying. I'm a character in the story you've, you, you've written and, and foreordained. So I, I think we have to keep in mind, there's this, this mystery in terms of how those relate, but they're obviously both true. Now, when it comes to this particular issue of baptismal efficacy and the possibility of apostasy, just, just think about this. Paul writes to uh, the Ephesians, and he says to the Ephesians, it's a very strong statement about election in chapter one, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Paul does not just say God chose some people. Right. He uses a personal pronoun, God chose us from before the foundation of the world. Paul addresses the visible Christian community in Ephesus as if they were all elect. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 20, when Paul is leaving Ephesus for the last time, and it's, it's this big goodbye scene, and they're, they're hugging each other and, and, and saying their goodbyes, and uh, Paul says, he, he warns the elders of the Ephesian church, he says, some false teachers will arise, wolves in sheep's clothing, even from among your own number. So even within, even within your session, there's going to be somebody who turns out to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, how can Paul, on the one hand, address the Ephesian church, God chose us, 
from the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus, and then turn around and say, but some of your elders are going to turn out to be wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> I mean, how can you make sense of those two things? He says you're elect, and he also says some of you are going to apostatize. <laughs> Okay. The, but the Bible gives us that tension. We have to live within that tension. Same thing in the book of Romans. Paul ends Romans 8 on the highest possible note of Christian assurance. We are more than conquerors. We're mega conquerors, super conquerors, hyper conquerors. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And then immediately at the start of chapter 9, he talks about how the Jewish people have been separated from the love of God. Right. They've, they've been cast off because of their sin. And of course, through, in chapters 9 through 11, he's got to go through and explain how all of that fits into God's plan. But then think about this. Romans 8, he says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. By the time you get to chapter 11, he's warning them about apostasy, saying, yes, you, you Gentile wild olive branches have been grafted into the tree. But if you don't stand firm in the faith, you can be broken out. And somebody might say, well, how can I be broken out? You just told me a few chapters before that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Well, we live within that tension right. of having total certainty and assurance of our salvation because of what Christ has done for us and our union with him by faith. That stands in constant tension with the reality that I could apostatize. Yeah. You know, if I, if, if I decide to turn away from Christ, I will be damned and go to hell. I've got to stick to Christ. Yeah, and as much as a comfort, the assurance is and should be, um, we should also be happy that we're, we haven't been made robots, that right. God actually does want a lively relationship um, with us, a covenantal relationship with us, um, where that marriage is analogous to it, you know. Right, right. Um, and, and what's interesting, you know, so I, I mentioned Luther before. Luther, uh, you know, Luther believes in the sovereignty of God and salvation. That's really clear from his book, Bondage of the Will. <laughs> Luther combined that with a strong doctrine of apostasy. Luther did it. Augustine did it. Uh, Augustine's the same way. I mean, we think of Calvinism as kind of a revival of Augustinianism, you know, at least in terms of how we understand salvation and that kind of thing. Um, but uh I would say it's there in Calvin too. I, again, Calvin's a little bit more meandering in how he gets there, but yes, Calvin believes obviously in the, in his name is synonymous with the sovereignty of God and salvation, but right. he also believes that the, that the, the very same people who mm -hmm. are addressed as the elect of God also have to be warned uh, about the need to persevere and they need to be warned about the dangers of apostasy. Yeah, that's really good. Um, this whole conversation, uh, the verse in Philippians is, keeps popping up in my head where Paul tells us to, to you know, work out what's been worked in. The, you know, the salvation that's been worked in you, work that out with fear and trembling. That's that, you know, God initiated, but we're not robots and there's an ongoing, your whole life uh, working out of that, of that regeneration, of that new life that has been uh, gifted to us. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Um, further study and reading. What uh, you know, other than uh, your your the stuff that you've written is very very helpful. I have a few of your books here I want to showcase. But if someone is really interested in this, uh, where would you like to point people? Well, yeah, it really depends how deep you want to go. Uh, if somebody wants uh, an overview of um, baptismal efficacy in the Reformed tradition. I actually have an essay uh, called something like, I think it's called Baptismal Efficacy in the Reformed Tradition. I think it's actually the title of the article. And it was one of the first articles that I published on this. Um, I went on from there to do some more specialized writing on Calvin's view, short and long articles on that. I have one that uh, I, I, I know several people have found helpful on um, Calvin's doctrine of baptism as it relates to penance and, okay. and his critique of penance. Uh, and, and that's one that people have found interesting. The do I believe in baptismal regeneration kind of wrestles with another set of these questions. In the um, Covenant Theological Journal Presbyterian, I did, a, I did an exchange with uh, Bill Evans over baptismal efficacy that I think cleared up some, some, some misconceptions. Uh, I mentioned the two articles in the Federal Vision book yep. uh, that uh, might be helpful. Um, you, you mentioned um, earlier M.F. Sadler's book. Uh, 
that's a really interesting book. I mean, I can't, you know, Sadler is not a perfect theologian by any stretch, but he does have a really good handle on uh, how to deal with a lot of these kinds of questions. And again, for Sadler, what you see is that questions about baptism are really questions about the church. Uh, what you say about baptism really correlates to what you're willing to say about the visible church in the Westminster. Conf- but let me just give you another example of this for, okay. you know, for any Presbyterian diehards out there who listen to this or think, how does all this fit together? The, uh, the Westminster confession of faith in its chapter on baptism, and this is uncontroversial. It tells us that in baptism, we are admitted to the visible church. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're admitted to the visible church in baptism. Even Baptists would agree. I mean, that's, a, that's, I think everybody would agree that in baptism, we are brought into the church. That's what baptism means. Okay. So Westminster teaches that Westminster also teaches in chapter 25, paragraph two, uh, Westminster teaches that the visible church is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and the household and family of God. So we can say, putting those two statements together, baptism brings you into the kingdom of Christ and the household and family of God. Now, I think there are a lot of things that, that follow from that. You know, we talked about paedo communion. The Westminster Divines rejected paedo communion, uh, I think, on, on very um, bad exegetical grounds in 1 Corinthians 11. But if, there, if, if everybody who is baptized comes into the kingdom, household, and family, okay, well, then you can ask the question, is God a father who feeds his family? I mean, you can ask a lot of questions about that. Um, but that, that, that tells you what your status is and how you should look at yourself or say, look at your children once they've been baptized. They're members of the kingdom, household, and family. And that's, that's a really remarkable claim. Yeah. So if baptism brings you into the kingdom, household, and family of God, uh, I think that that sits very well with a doctrine of baptismal regeneration. I mean, how can you get into God's family without a rebirth of some sort? That's right. If, if we are by nature in the family of Adam and in baptism, we're brought into the family and household of God. Surely that requires some kind of regenesis, re- rebirth, recreation of who we are. Um, in in uh, John's gospel, of course, Jesus famously said to enter the kingdom, you must be born again. Well, if the Westminster Confession teaches me that I'm admitted to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism, does that in some way mean that my rebirth happened in baptism? Um, I think Calvin would be very willing to say that. I think yeah. some of the Westminster divines, at least, would have had no problem with that, you know, with that way of speaking and thinking about it. So, um, you, you asked about resources. Um, I've mentioned some of my articles. Um, I've, I've got some others, but th- those would be the main ones that I would point people to if they want to pursue this question further. Uh, a few other books that, that are real helpful. Uh, I don't typically like to recommend um, Methodist <laughs> theologians, yeah. uh, especially given all that's going on in the Methodist church. But William Willimon has a book called Remember Your Baptism, I think is what it's called, which actually is a pretty good introduction to baptism. Like if you're looking for something that's at a very basic level, um, there's a book by Leonard Vanderzee on the sacraments uh, that I think is very helpful. Uh, Peter Lightheart has written some things on baptism that are, yeah, that are, that are very useful. Um, so there's, there's a lot of good resources out there. And book four of Calvin's Institutes. And book four of Calvin's Institutes. Absolutely. Don't forget reading Calvin himself. Um, that's right. And uh, just to jump back very quickly, you talked about um, if we understand baptism to be and admittance into the kingdom of God, into the family, um, and the household of faith, that, that gives it practical, uh, benefit and value where sometimes, um, you know, uh, whether, whether it's good or bad, people will think, oh, you're just theologizing. You're just all up in your head. What do I do with this in my life? And I think you just gave it some legs to this matters in your life. It matters how you parent how you raise up your kids and the type of identity that you, uh, that you bring them up in. That's part of that fear and admonition of the Lord. They're a Baptist. Well, so one, one other thing I should mention as far as resources yeah. go is my book, Pato faith, yeah. which I don't know. I, I, it may be the only book out there right, on right. infant faith. I, yeah, I certainly, I, I don't, I don't want to make the claim. It is the only book ever written on infant faith. Cause I don't think that's true, but it, there's not many of them. But when I was working through all of these issues, I found this to be one of the missing pieces, in a sense, mm-hmm. uh, that, that, that I think I think 
for a lot of people, as they're thinking through these issues, really kind of helped things click into place. Like it was kind of the one missing ingredient that they needed to kind of make sense out of a lot of, out of, a lot of things. Uh, and, and it's, it's, so I said that what is offered to us in baptism has to be received by faith. Well, again, what does that mean for an infant? Yeah. Well, I, I do not knowingly baptize unbelievers. Uh, when I baptize a baby, I baptize that baby trusting that what the word of God says is true. And that therefore, when I baptize the child of a believing Christian, I am baptizing a believer. Right. And that's based on a lot of different things. Psalm 22, where David talks about trusting in God, even as a nursing infant, no, you know, having God as his God, even in the womb, which obviously David can't remember that far back. Mm -hmm. But he's saying this because he's looking at his life from even being in his mother's womb. He's looking at his life through the lens of God's covenant promise, knowing that God has been his God all along, that he's had a trusting and loving relationship. And I would say the ideal, the biblical norm, if we sang Psalm 22 all the time, uh, if we sang it instead of some of the revivalistic hymns that make an adult conversion experience the norm, if we sang Psalm 22, maybe a lot of these things would make a lot more sense to us, or other Psalms that talk about this, or just other passages in scripture that talk about children this way. I mean, Jesus blessed little children. Why bless somebody if they can't receive it? Blessings can only be received as blessings by faith. And Jesus blesses the little children that are brought to him. So clearly those children could receive um, a blessing. If you want your child to receive Jesus' blessing today, what do you do? You bring your child to church. You bring your child to be baptized. You bring your child to the table. You bring your child to be uh, under the ministry of the word. That's how you get your child to Jesus today. And that same blessing that Jesus was putting on children in Matthew 18 or 19 will be for your child as well uh, when, when, when you do this. Of course, uh, I think the key to all of this is parents believing and claiming the covenant promises God has made. I will be a God to you and to your children, Genesis 17. Mm -hmm. But the thing about infant faith that's so important is that I think it makes a lot of these other things make sense that I can really say that my child is a Christian. I can raise my child as a Christian. Parenting is a form of Christian discipleship. What mother, what Christian mothers and fathers are doing is they are discipling baby Christians. Yep. Uh, and that changes the way we discipline. It changes the way we speak to and about our children. It revolutionizes the way we pray for our kids, uh, understanding that they are part of God's covenant family. We're not constantly trying to convert our children, get them to have some kind of conversion experience as they get a little bit older. Rather, we are nurturing that faith that God has already given to them. And that makes, I think, a world of difference uh, in terms of family life. And I've always thought there was a, a real inconsistency. I mean, you know, you can see this with I would say with Baptists who, you know, in some ways will treat their kids as Christians and in some ways not. True. Uh, but I think Presbyterians do the same kind of thing a lot of times where in certain ways the, the, the child will be treated as a Christian in other ways yeah. not. We're going to celebrate all the Christian holidays with you. We'll celebrate yeah. Christmas with you, even though uh, we won't let you come to the Lord's table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we're going to, we expect you to live by Christian standards of behavior and we'll discipline you if you don't. Uh, but we're not going to give you the nourishment you need at the Lord's table mm -hmm. to live that Christian life. Uh, I think there, there's a real disconnect there. So right, raising right. your your children consistently as Christians. And I've, I've known parents who have said, oh, I know my child's not a Christian because he sinned the other day. You know, he told a lie. Well, the, the, the thing is, that does not mean your child's not a Christian. It just means they're a Christian who sins, which incidentally, you are too. Yeah, it just means you probably pulled a line like in the same time frame <laughs> as your child did. Uh, so, so that does not mean your child's not a Christian. And I think what it does, I, I love the way Cornelius Van Til described his, his upbringing in his booklet, uh, Why I'm a Christian. Uh, you know, he was raised in this, in this very Dutch Calvinistic yeah. home. And he says, we never had any monsoons, but the relative humidity was always very high. <laughs> so he never had the big conversion, you know, emotionalized conversion experience, the big storm that blows through like the tent revivals wanted mm -hmm. people to have, but the relative human, we were always saturated in the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so I think, again, the ideal, the norm for our children ought to be to grow up never knowing a day when they didn't love and trust Jesus. That yeah, just, yeah. just, just as kids in normal circumstances cannot remember the first time they were introduced to their earthly father. They cannot remember when they were first introduced to their heavenly father because he's always already been there for them. And again, I, so I think all of this together, it just gives us a very beautiful picture of, you know, not just church life, 
uh, but I think family life as well. Uh, it means that parental discipline, fatherly discipline becomes a form of church discipline. And one thing we did for our kids when they were growing up, when we would, when we would discipline them, uh, of course, we would always identify the sin they're being disciplined for. I think that's important. We would discipline them and then we would, you know, hold them and hug them as they cry it out and seek to restore fellowship. But we would also, um, I would also pronounce absolution. Mm. Good. And, and a lot of times I would use, I would keep bulletins where we did our disciplining, usually in the bathroom, and I would keep mm-hmm. bulletins from church in there so I could read those exact same words that they would hear on a Sunday, that your sins are forgiven. Uh, so that they had that constant reminder, sin is forgiven, sin is forgiven, sin is forgiven. God's washed you, God's made you clean, you belong to God. Uh, I wrote a catechism. This would be another resource if somebody's looking for yes. something. I wrote a catechism for little children that, uh, I you know, it's... We used it inconsistently in my own family, but I wrote it, and that's because my kids were getting other catechesis at school and that kind of thing, but I wrote it specifically with the intent of reinforcing this kind of covenantal identity in the minds and hearts of our children, a baptismal identity. So I actually say in the intro to the catechism, I say really all of this flows out of the fact that your child is baptized. Mm-hmm. And so, so it starts out, who are you? I'm a child of God. You know, I belong to God. Um, God is my God and I am God's child. Very good. Awesome. Um, well, uh, I thank you so much for, uh, yeah, thank you, Grant, for sharing your time with us and, and going through all of that. It's super helpful, not only to get the history, but talk about the language and the different positions and stuff. There's, there's even so much more. I hope, I hope this, this understanding gets more airtime. Um, and, and we can, recover some of that stuff that that's been lost due to rationalism um and that pietism so yeah. so i really appreciate it guys rich has also written a couple of commentaries i don't have the ruth one he's co-authored these with um dr brito who has yeah. been on the show a couple of times i have the jonah one this is the this is the newest one that they have or more most recent should i say and um so go pick these up athanasius press um, has put out, I don't know if all of your books, but most of them. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I did another one with Yuri. It's not an Athanasius press book, but another one with Yuri and with, uh, pastor Randy Booth yes. called church friendly family. And it, it, it touches on some of these same kind of things we've talked about here today too. Awesome. So again, I will make sure that I throw links, um, to, to all of that in the description. So if you want to pick up his books, check it out in the description. Um, anything else you'd like to, to plug rich, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to your website with some of the PDFs yeah, of these do. essays. No. Um, but a- anything other than that? I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, I, I hope this was really helpful. Yeah. Thank and, you. Um, you're, yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for, for coming on again. And guys, if you have questions, throw them down in the comments below, takeholdstudios at gmail.com. If you want to email it. Um, I hope that this conversation generates some questions that would, that would be really cool. So, um, anyway, until next time, guys, take hold and reorder creation by first reforming your home. This has been the reformed reset, but on the basis of grace and on the finished work of Jesus Christ, the project is back and forth and the destiny of a new transformed world is assured. put the sourdough in the oven too so I've got like 40 minutes.